you know what we do. You've heard quite a bit about the various experiments that have been done. And as you remember in my talk in particular, I emphasized how we do things rather than the, the results. So this is a, today is a, going to be a mixed bag in the sense that we'll be looking at the consequences of what comes from those protocols that we utilize. Oh, thank you, Manuela. Okay, micronuclei and DNA damage foci formation. You've seen the DNA damage foci formation from Alan. You saw it with your very own eyes. Seeing is believing, is what it, my motto anyway. But micronuclei, <coughs> which were the first endpoint that we looked at here, I showed you an example. You might recall when we had the table about the three different cell lines, healers, 10 T and a half cells, and A sub L cells. Three cell lines where the nuclear cross-sectional areas were quite different. And that was deliberate. And we went through the rationale for how you relate particles per cell to dose. And this example uh, you saw in the table at the bottom. But here, specifically, we have the comparison. So the previous uh, material that you were shown showed you how you can actually do this comparison in a dosimetric metric sense, and these are the results. Now you're left with a question, why? This very clearly is a linear relationship, micronuclei going up as a function, and here of course we're converting dose to alpha particles, which in the case of the track segment is a mean, and in the case of a microbeam is an actual. So this is actual number of particles per nuclei. This is mean number of particles per nuclei. And this is coming across. Now, why might you, might you think that could be the case? There is a difference, obviously. Now, why might that be? What's the difference between this and this? This is an average, so um, some nuclei might have received more alpha particles than the others, so those who receive higher number of alpha particles will have more like micronuclear formation. That, that is true. You have a, a range here, but down here at one, 30% of the cells don't see any for the average. But how are they delivered? Think about how they're delivered. What's the difference between delivering random particles and microbeam particles. What do we do each time when the nucleus is put targeted on the microbeam, as you saw Alan do? You're not shooting at random, are you? You're shooting precisely in the middle of the cell. So this is starting to tell you straight away that there is not uniform sensitivity throughout the cell nucleus. Now you have a question you can probe further. But and in, I'm not showing you the results for the healers, the 10 T and a half and the others. It's not the same for all cell lines. So if I actually showed you the results for those three, which I'm leaving out for the sake of brevity, you are not going to get the same results. So never, ever assume that because you get a result with one cell line, you're going to get it with another. You've got to do it. Now, what did we mean <coughs> by my, what, what, <coughs> sorry about this. What do we mean by micronuclei? We're now going to get into how you see them, and how you score them. Another cell type, these are keratinocytes, normal human keratinocytes, where are, keratins, where are keratinocytes? 
They're the, the cells in the skin. They're responsible for making keratin. And this morning when you had a shower, what you were washing off were the degraded skin cells, which essentially are just sheets of keratin. So keratinocytes can be placed in front of the microbeam, as can almost any cell type. And then you can ask, uh, OK, I want to look at the effects of that irradiation. And in this instance, we put bromodeoxyuridine on the cells to monitor their progression through the cell cycle. And this is stained. The bromodeoxyuridine labeled uh, DNA is tagged with an antibody against, with, against the BRDU label, coupled with fluorescein isothiocyanate, which gives you this yellow fluorescence. So that cells that have taken up bromodeoxyuridine are the yellow ones, here, here, and here. And what you know by doing this is that these cells have progressed through the cell cycle. If you see an orange stain nucleus, here and here, for example, that cell is still in G1, 24 hours later. So if a cell is still in G1 and you're looking for micronuclei, you would not expect to see micronuclei here because they haven't gone through the cycle and you only express micronuclei after a division. So if you look at these guys, these can give you a very good sample of the background incidence of micronuclei because they were never, they have never expressed the micronuclei from radiation. But this is what the sort of thing you're looking at. These two are closely associated. They've gone through the cell cycle, gone through S phase, gone through mitosis. These are the two daughter nuclei with micronuclei and another term I used was a bridge. Here, here, there's a micronucleus. There's your chromosomal bridge, which comes from the separation of a dicentric chromosome. Chromosomes broke, rearranged themselves. You get a dicentric. Those centromeres go in opposite directions at anaphase, and they essentially pull the chromosome apart. So this is a bridge between the two. That's what I mean by a bridge. And as you can see, these are easy to see, yeah. So when you see the micronuclei, that means there was no cytokinesis? Oh, no, no, no. On the contrary, there has been cytokinesis. Otherwise, you wouldn't have these two daughter cells, these two daughter nuclei, or these two daughter nuclei. You have to get cytokinesis. When you see a big circle here, green color? On green the color. Left side, so yeah. this is the one cell? That's one cell. So how, how do you say there are micronuclei? Here's the micronuclei here. Oh, over there. Okay. There and there. And in this instance, it's even clearer because you know that these are two cells that have come about from the division of one cell. You started out with one cell that looked like this, whereas this one stayed without moving through the cell cycle. All these others that are colored green did move through the cell cycle. And these here are examples of ones that have gone through mitosis gone through cell cycle and gone through mitosis to allow for the expression of micronuclei. Can you track the micronuclei are coming from mother cell or from the daughter cell? No, these are the daughters. These are the daughter cells from that original irradiated cell. So the ir irradiated cell would have been like this initially. It goes through S phase. It takes up the bromodeoxyuridine. It looks like this. It goes through mitosis, and it looks like that. So this, the specific one, at this time, you cannot know. All you can know is that that original mother cell, if you like, was at this position. So mother cells will retain the red color? No. Yes, the mother cells will retain the red color because they won't have moved. Yes, exactly. So this is a very good way of, of as you can see, it's, it's a hit you in the eye study, which you're getting a lot of information from.
fairly straightforward, fairly simple. So the micronucleus assay, as I said, straightforward, simple, and it's a good one if you're starting out doing microbeam studies. <coughs> Just other examples. I put these up because basically because I like them. They're pretty. So here is an example of a bridge between these two nuclei and the acentric fragments or the micronuclei sitting here. Now those cells were keratinocytes. We're now shifting to another cell type, a melanocyte. And in fact, what I did, I used, when I started these studies, I was interested in the differences in radiation response of different cell types from the human body. And the best situation you can have is to derive different cell types from the same individual. Why? Why would that be good? Why would that be the best situation to, to derive different cell types from the same individual as opposed to different individuals? So you are fixing all the other conditions, so you have cells who are growing the same conditions so that is true. The, well, the conditions have to vary because some of these have different requirements. But same is the word. Now, same. Why are they the same? They come from the same individual. You, for example. Same or you. Name. Exactly. So in other words, there is the same genetic control. The genetic background in those cells is the same. Nice situation if you can do it. If you're thinking about it, you're interested in intercomparisons between cell types, think in terms of getting them from the same person to ensure that they have the same genetic background. There's another point about melanocytes which makes them interesting. They're very <coughs> elongated, as you can see, very long. The nucleus is here, the cytoplasm is going out here. One advantage about a melanocyte is that it contains melanin. Melanin is what makes our skin go brown in the sun, but it also autofluoresces. So you put these under a fluorescence microscope and you can see the cytoplasm because of the melanin in the cytoplasm very elongated. How can they be so elongated? Because they move. Keratinocytes sit in one place and essentially stay there. They don't move very much. They're in these block structures in the skin, but melanocytes move around within the dermis. They don't stay in one place. And these guys can really romp around. So that if you irradiate on any given day, you put your bromodeoxyuridine on them to monitor their cell cycle progression and then ask day one versus day two, are they in the same place? No. No, 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 no. These things can move five, 800 micrometers in 24 hours. So a cell nucleus that might have been here when you started is going to be up here the next day. So don't assume when you're doing a microbeam study and you know where you hit your cells that they are going to be in that place the next day. You have to take account of the fact that these things can and do move and in my experience at least melanocytes are the racehorses of the cell types of the human body. They really do gallop around. But they show the same sort of results. Here is an example. Here, this is one cell in this direction. This is the daughter cell coming down here. This is the bridge between them, which is shown by the, the yellow fluorescence, the bromodeoxyuridine. The bromodeoxyuridine is in this bridge. And here are the micronuclei here and here. OK, the question that came up for us was, all right, 
we are inducing these chromosome breaks and interchanges so that as the cells separate, the daughter cells separate, this DNA is sort of pulling apart like a skein of wool. Now, it's almost as if you had a roll of DNA which is gradually unwinding. How far can they go? The longest one I saw was 800 micrometers. Which, when you think about it, this is pretty cool. How can it? We know that in a chromosome, the DNA is tightly wound. So what you are looking at is a consequence of that DNA unwinding. And you can see it using an approach like this, using bromodeoxyuridine. There's an example, <coughs> one example here. Just, oh, could you turn, is it possible to, where's the lights? It might hurt if we could just turn this off for a minute. The lights are, yeah. Oh, that'll probably turn everything off. Maybe just to help you see this a bit better. Okay, I think I might do it. Okay, what we're concentrating on is this one here. Is a cell here, is a cell there. See this? There's a band there coming across. Da 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 da. That is joined to that. Okay? Are we agreed? That's a bridge. So that these came from the same mother cell. But, see here? you seem to have something that's going through to there. How is this possible? How is it possible to get a bridge from there to there and yet a bridge from there to there? I better tell you because it puzzled me for a long time. This actually was picked up at 72 hours. So what has happened is you've had a cell that has replicated and separated and then those two daughter cells have replicated and in one instance separated and the other instance not. You look at the size of this. This is actually two of these. So this one has not divided, which is perhaps understandable. It is a bit screwed up from having lost some DNA. And these two have divided. So not, it, it, all, it is almost incomprehensible that a piece of DNA, which you might think is not hanging free, these things here or here, they are still encased in a membrane. They can replicate. So you're having induction of chromosomal interchanges which separate between cell nuclei. They then replicate and then they separate. So it's like taking a, a, a strand of rope and just pulling it apart into its constituent strands. So a very simple experiment can result in something that can blow your mind. I still don't understand how this can happen, but seeing is believing. The eyes tell you that the only way you can explain this is by the induction of an initial chromosome interchange, separation into two, replication, and then separation in one instance yet again, but with that initial break retained and replicated. Are these bridges microtubules? Pardon? The bridges which you see. They will have they will have microtubules in them, yes. So oh they're not no no that's DNA. What you're looking at is DNA. The bridges which are seen here. They they are, they are DNA. Are DNA. Yes. What you're looking at is DNA. And <coughs> this is an example of how far they can go. And obviously this is two frames. You can't include everything in one frame. 
So you've got one frame here, unwinding, continuing on to the second nucleus there. Uh, this one I think is about uh, 210, 220 micrometers from the midpoint here to the midpoint there. There are other cell types. Oh, this is an example of micronuclei here, here. But when you see something like this, these multiple structures, that's apoptosis. When you see a multi-micronucleate body, you're looking at apoptosis. So in other words, you've had nuclear breakdown, condensation of the DNA, and it's present in these multi-micronucleate bodies. So these things are a morphological indicator of apoptosis. Okay, now we've also done a lot of work here and you've seen our uh, microscope down, down below. We have another one just like that in the city. It was right outside my office in the city. For looking at chromosomes where I'm talking about processed chromosomal spreads now where we can examine chromosomal aberrations and color each of the individual chromosomes. This is what they look like in interphase with micronuclei. So you, if you have something like the M fish, the M refers to multiplex and the fish is fluorescence in situ hybridization multiplex fluorescence in situ hybridization. These kits are out there for all the human chromosomes. So if you use a cocktail of these human chromosomes, you'll finish up with nuclei that look like this. They look like masses of chromosomes. But each of these entities here are part of individual chromosomes. One, two, three, four. If you use these, you can actually determine which chromosomes your micronuclei come from. We're not going to go through which ones these are, but all I'm saying is you can. You can determine the origin, the specific origin of micronuclei using an assay like the MFISH assay. And you don't have to prepare chromosomal spreads on slides to do it. You just have to have a fluorescence microscope. Yay. Oh, I'm sorry, you saw you had a question. Yeah. These two are the same. This one, this one, this one, this one. And the reason why is these are just stained with DARPI, so this is just DNA. Whereas here, the micronuclei, these two come from the same one, these come from something different. This is the other micronucleus here, and that's from a, a different chromosome. So these are, that's the one cell, that's the one cell. Yeah. Can we study this uh, chromosomal aberration by using pulse field gel electrophoresis? Um, not easily, no, no. How many cells do you I mean, pu <coughs> Pulse field, essentially, if, if at low at low doses, the answer is no. At high doses, you can yes, because the the radiation causes so many interchanges. So that you'll finish up with a lot of DNA molecules linked and as essentially larger than normal molecules, they do not move well through the, through the electrophoretic field. So they will, instead of giving you, uni you used your normal pulse field and you'll finish up with bands, uniform bands. You use a high dose of radiation, these will smear all over the place. Low doses, the, it, the system is not sensitive enough to pick up the effects of low doses. What do you mean by low and high? What, what number we are talking in terms uh, of alpha particles? Oh, in terms of alpha particles, you probably know, and you need to go uh, in excess of 15 to 20 per cell. If you were using ionizing radiation, you, would have seen, you wouldn't even attempt to do it under, under 2 gray if you're using X-rays or gamma rays. Actually, so by, by low, I don't mean, yeah, I guess if you normally think of low as being below 0.1 of a gray, these really are quite high doses before a pulse field gel electrophoresis study can be useful for you. 
Okay. Ho, oh, ho, ho, ho. Um, all of a sudden, we actually have a gel. Um. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, I know. It was Manuela? It was not. Okay. Now, you're going to get uh, some more work on, on the gamma H2AX and the DNA damage. In this particular instance, this, was, uh, this particular study was done by my colleague Balaji in the city. Uh, Balaji and I have done some very nice work together over the years. And here the idea, as you can see here, gamma H2 intensity, fluorescence intensity per cell. So in other words, you're processing your cells for gamma H2AX and you're measuring the fluorescence per cell here. These are not low doses. This is a five gray of gamma ray dose. Why? Because you're looking for a dramatic effect. It's as simple as that. And the question here was, we wanted to compare two human cell lines where one of the cell lines was deficient in DNA damage repair and this cell line was derived from an individual with ataxia telangiectasia. Good morning, Brian. Sorry. You can at least say good morning. Good morning, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt the floor. So the ataxias are radiation sensitive and these are the normals. Okay. You can plot the intensity here or for a population of cells, you can show the gamma H2AX, and this is the protein now, here in the normal cells versus the AT cells as a function of time. And our intent here was to look at this replication protein, which is associated. A number of these molecules in their phosphorylated form bind to sites where DNA damage has been initiated you actually get a string of these RPAs. But very clearly, these DNA damage deficient uh, cells do not form gamma H2X foci anywhere near as efficiently as normal cells. So the frequency is dramatically different. The kinetics of repair, however, is marginally different but very clearly after the AT the incidence is staying high. So you can do a number of studies involving cells of different origins, DNA repair deficient and the like. Now shifting to the RPA in its various forms. When you look at cells down the microscope, you can see a number of patterns. And these can be defined by your image analysis system. In this instance, we noted that basically, even though we don't understand what's going on at the molecular level yet, we can define different types based on the patterns, the fluorescence patterns that we see. We're now interested in looking at gamma H2AX, which as you can see is uh, punctate. In other words, in different solid spots here, is distributed in lots of small spots here oop, and here. But here you have a very uniform distribution of gamma H2AX. Quite different. Sometimes you see foci, sometimes you don't. Don't assume that it will behave the same in all cells. It doesn't. There are cell cycle phase differences, and within phases of the cell cycle, there are also differences. And then using the other uh, repair protein, RPA, you can see yet again, there are quite distinct differences in the types of foci that form, which when you combine the two, gives you images like this. High doses, yeah, these are high doses high doses in order to establish 
something which you will then look at in more detail. Now, as we've said on a number of instances, this is a user facility. We encourage people to come in from outside to do research with our microbeam to enhance their science. And this is an example from a colleague of, of ours, Susan Bailey, who's at Colorado State University. And Susan's principal interest is in telomeres. And she is very concerned with the involvement of uh, telomere associated factors, and this is just one of them. And a paper came out saying that this particular protein was associated with uh, DNA damage. And Susan thought, well, I don't think this is right based on what I see. But the only way she could prove it was by using a microbeam. So she sent her cells here, and Brian was actually involved in doing the experiments. You did those, right? Yeah. Brian did these experiments for her, sent them back, and then she analyzed them. And the question was, is this TRF2 associated with known DNA damage repair factors? So in this instance, this is the site of irradiation here. This is the site of irradiation here. 200 alpha particles after 10 minutes, this is what you get. 400 alpha particles after 10 minutes, this is what you get. And the question is, is this factor associated with the DNA damage repair sites? And very clearly, it is not. You merge them, and no. So a clear-cut conclusion, which she could make definitively because she had access to a DNA damaging entity which not completely but largely restricts damage to a known site in the nucleus. Okay? That's one example from Susan Bailey. These are essentially she's another the MDC1 is another DNA damage repair marker. So essentially, significant co-localization DNA damage markers can be seen following localized alpha particle and later time points, half an hour and an hour, show an increase in the size of regions marked by gamma rays to XMDC1. So here, deliberately, she, or she didn't, I guess Alan chose where the sites were, were going to be placed. In this instance, it was decided to deliberately keep them away from the center of the the nucleus. Would you like to tell me why? Why would we not want, in these, in these particular studies, why would we not want to target the nuclear centroid the way we normally do? Because the nucleolus organizer tends to confine itself to the middle parts of the cell. So you wanted to go to areas where you were sure that there was going to be a significant amount of DNA. So quite deliberately in this instance, regions adjacent to the cell mem. Yes? I have a question. Um, when we do this experiment, I uh, wonder why we need uh, so many alpha particles to do this mutation. I mean, hundreds of alpha, like... Yeah, you, you, you don't need is the simple answer. But what you're looking for is a hit you in the eye response. We're not trying to find what the minimum level is. She wasn't interested in finding what the minimum level was. All she wanted to do was get a response to answer a particular question. And you, if that's the, the case, you go for high doses where you increase your likelihood of getting the answer you want. It makes it more black and white. <coughs> makes it clearer, yes. If she wanted to, or if we wanted to, put a lot more time and effort into looking at the dose response, or fluence response, I should say. Yes, we could have done it, but... Susan wanted a fairly rapid result, which was published in uh, Nature Genetics. Yes, it was published in Nature Genetics, 
the rebuttal, a short communication, was published in Nature Genetics. Okay. Uh, yet and again, another example of um, work from an outside collaborator, Keiji Suzuki in Japan. He, Keiji worked in the lab for two years. At I guess it's about eight, ten years ago now and is now a professor at his institute in Japan and uh, he has visited us on at least three occasions and actually done experiments here. So he's come from, come from Japan to use our microbeam. And as you know, there are now at least uh, microbeams in Japan. So Keiji is uh, looking for sites of irradiation and also looking for expression of uh, in non-irradiated cells. So this is a bystander type study. So you have cell populations, you pick a targets to hit and targets not to hit and your foci in your hit cells are appearing like so and essentially what you're asking is do you see foci in non-hit cells and the simple answer is yes you do and that's an example there. These mark the non-hit cells. Well, there's a whole series of these. Hit cells versus non-hit side or orange tag cells. So the same protocol that you saw described earlier, which Brian and, and I devised a number of years ago, uh, is now used by others to answer questions of interest to them. Another uh, one of our Japanese collaborators, and you heard mention of this particular protocol, I think Gerhard might have mentioned it first, uh, Tomu Funiyama from JRE. He was here for six months? A year. A year, yeah. Okay. And essentially picked a region, a circular, a wheel-like region on a, on a microbeam dish and irradiated within that wheel. So this is the wheel which essentially goes right around the dish. So these, you have hit cells in here, non-hit cells out here. Non-hit, hit, non-hit. Non and he's asking, okay, what will I see? And one thing that you can see quite clearly here in the hit cells, there's a micronucleus there, there's a micronucleus there, and you'll see micronuclei and or gamma H2AX. So the, in the hit cells, definitely, question is, do you see gamma H2AX in the non-hit bystander cells? And the simple answer is, yes you do, using this particular protocol. So the radiation of cells in here, and clearly the cells aren't moving, because these are near confluent. There's no room for them to move around. So these guys out here are responding to signals produced by the damaged cells in here. This is some work that uh, a colleague of mine, Peter Grabham, who works in the centre in the city, did out at Brookhaven. But the analysis was done here at Nevis by Alan Bigelow. And uh, Peter was using high energy iron ions uh, on normal human endothelial cells. And essentially what Alan did was do Z-stack reconstructions of gamma H2X foci. You see these nice foci here, 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 when you're looking down at a cell. Here, here. Alan starts at the top and takes sections, slices through the nucleus. And what do you get? This is what you get. You can see the consequences of that damage from this high LET. This is 150, 160 keV per micrometer, 1 GeV ion ion, in these cell nuclei. And what is also clear is that it is quite different. This, this, it's quite different from these 
little sites. Here, here, there are little spots. So that's a spot, that's a spot, that's a spot. But these guys here are tracks, dense tracks, which when you just look at the top, you don't know. So if you've got an image analysis system which is capable, as ours is, of doing this Z-stack reconstruction, you can generate a lot more useful information. And that's it, I think. Oh no. Oh no, I forgot about the micronuclei. <laughs> All right. So now to go into some detail about micro... This is in the book and essentially it's yet again a protocol for actually scoring micronuclei. And it was established by uh, a, essentially a, a collaboration between many different laboratories. In other words, a lot of laboratories, oh it says here, 25. 25 laboratories in 16 countries came up with this set of criteria that you should use when you're scoring micronuclei. Identical but smaller than, round or oval in shape, diameter, not linked, and th this is the degree of compliance between the 25 labs for these different endpoints. So, examples. If you looked down the microscope and you saw that, what would you say? Was that a micronucleus? I think you'd say it was. What about you, Manuela? Is that a micronucleus? I don't see the two daughters in the sun. Would no, you don't have to. So, yes. Yes. So you've got something that is distinct, smaller than, same intensity. Not much doubt about it. Okay. What do we got here? Uh, this is off the chart a bit, but yes. Three, yes. Something strange going on there, no. Yes, yes. But here, that is actually the remnants of a bridge. So it's not a micronucleus, it's the remnants of a bridge. See how it sort of comes out? This at one point was connected to another cell. But that is a true micronucleus. That is not. Isn't the one in the center too small? This one? Oh, yes, if you like. <laughs> See? We've already decided to disagree. <laughs> I would say yes, because I can see it as clearly as I can. And I tend to see things that other people don't see. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming from a background of trying to automate this assay. And a micronucleus that's that size can be confused with noise in the image in the yeah. automation context. Yes. And so that's where we're having problems agreeing between the neural network image analysis and what I have to write in code. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you would see that an automatic system for recognizing micronuclei will typically be give a yield that's 20 to 50 percent lower than Charles would or Manuela or Antonella or any of the other biologists. We will never be replaced. Remember that. Humans will never be replaced by machines. <laughs> Dr. Brenner might prefer it that way, but it's not going to happen for a while yet. In my case, it doesn't matter. For Manuela and, and Guy and Brian, it does. Okay, now this is what happens when you process it, as Guy was talking about. And you know, obviously, you have more condensed chromatin here than you do in the nucleus. But nevertheless, I would say that's a, a clear micronucleus. If this got fuzzier, Guy might exclude it, but I wouldn't. Yes, yes, rubbish, rubbish. Now, is that touching or isn't it? Should these be included, these two little guys there? 
Now I would say yes, Guy would say no. The machine would say no. The machine wouldn't even see those two. Oh, okay. But you can see them. Barely. Oh, come on. I need your glasses. <laughs> Change your prescription. Uh, but I guess what we're here, no, it's not. It's a bleb, so called. No. But these are examples of what you see looking down a microscope. When you look down a microscope, you'll see all sorts of things. If you can imagine it, you'll probably see it sooner or later. Just set in your mind as firmly as you can the criteria that you are going to use and stick with it. There's more examples. Here you actually have two nuclei. But you look at this and in point of fact in this instance this is still the same colour as that. So just because it's not as dense as the ones previously doesn't mean you exclude it. Yes, it's certainly two micronuclei, maybe three, but for safety's sake you'd say two. This is another cell. This is a, a highly condensed nucleus. That's actually an apoptotic, a con very highly condensed apoptotic cell. But that's another endpoint which you uh, would achieve familiarity with by doing it. That's the only way to get familiar with these things, to actually look at them and determine what's going on. Uh, can we consider it apoptotic without seeing fragmentation? And, uh, it's very, if you look here, you could probably, you would actually see this if you're looking down a microscope. You've actually got multiple micronuclei there, very highly condensed. So extreme chromatin condensation is a characteristic of apoptosis. Multi-micronucleation is a characteristic of apoptosis. The organization of DNA in the small, smaller nucleus is often an indication of apoptosis. For example, in lymphocytes that are going apoptotic, you get a half moon effect. So you'll get, you'll see a rounded cell, but the DNA is concentrated in the form of a half moon on one side of the cell. To me, that's absolutely diagnostic of apoptosis in cells of lymphopoietic origin. Do micronuclei contain any particular fraction of the genome? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, they, they, they will rep analysis. Yes. Did they will replicate independently also. Because so they've got the replication origins as well. Any particular chromosome which is present in this micronuclei? Uh, no. They are produced at random. They do not survive at random, though. So if you look at cells over a, a number of, of cellular generations, normally they're lost very rapidly because they don't have a centromere. There's nothing, nothing to keep them around. But sometimes you'll get the retention of an acentric fragment if it's of advantage to the cell. In other words, that micronucleus can result in a duplication of a particular advantageous gene sequence, which is now present in, in two copies, because the other one's already there. There's some chromosomes. And if you look at that, as soon as you see that, you know where those chromosomes came from. They're not human, are they? Where are they from? Mouse. Mouse chromosomes have their centromeres near the end of the chromosomes. All mouse chromosomes are so-called subtelometric, subtelomeric chromosomes. <coughs> so the telomeres are very close to the centromeres and they have one short arm, very short arm, and one long arm. But they're mouse chromosomes. How'd that get in there? 
Okay.